but uh, it's good to have the Hotley family here uh, with us. Well, we're wrapping up this, this book today, and next week we'll start, Lord willing, the book of Joel, but we've been working through this love story. Um, it's been hard at times, but aren't relationships hard when we truly are loving people and, and in the lives of others? As you look at the jersey, it's another reminder of the fact that we have been working through a summer in the minors and that um, this jersey represents a lot to me. I love the history of baseball and uh, a team that started out in New York. I didn't know if you knew that. The Giants started out in New York and uh, ultimately went to the West Coast to be in San Francisco. But Willie Mays was part of that team, the Say Hey Kid goes to San Francisco and plays. But something that comes to my mind is um, a sad story, uh, the story of Barry Bonds and, uh, and uh, steroids uh, controversy that was hitting full, um, full swing, literally, um, in the early 2000s. A book was written by Jose Canseco called Juiced, and he kind of narked on all of them. He told on his teammates, um, uh, Rafael Palmero and um, a guy named, struggle with this name, Mark McGuire, I think was the guy's name, when they were out in Oakland together. And then um, as a result of that, these guys were brought before Congress. Baseball has a different relationship with our country than other sports just because of the deep roots of it. And you think, why did they, but they're brought before the Senate and they're asked questions and Palmero was asked concerning his being a part of it and he said that I've never done it and within weeks they did a test and it was in his bloodstream. Um, McGuire, McGuire was confronted and he said, if you remember his famous saying, uh, let's not, I don't want to focus on the past here. I want to focus on the future. Well, that's good, unless if you've been doing something you shouldn't. And then Sammy Sosa, I can't believe this, but a Chicago Cub was involved in something like this. He's confronted, and a guy that could do interviews, he would say, baseball has been very, very good to me. Um, and he could do English, but when he got before the Senate, my man could not speak English. He had, a ha he had to have a translator, and, uh, and so it was, it was just the reality of what was going on at the time. It caused me to think about what we deal with in life when we're dealing with these prophets. There's a group of people that have been caught. Their hand is in the cookie jar. They are doing something they shouldn't be doing. And God's calling them on it. And the temptation would be, I don't know what you're talking about. Or, that's the past. We need, to, we need to be thinking about the future. Or I've never done that. I don't know what you're talking about. But when the test is given, yeah, you're, you're, you're doing what you said you weren't doing. Let's pray and then get into this, uh, this as we're wrapping up. Father, thank you for this book. Thank you for how you've used it. Uh, you've, you've taken us from a romantic relationship with a husband and wife him knowing he was going to be let down by her. Him knowing that she was going to fall into the sin that she was going to fall into. But it was a picture of you, that loving groom and a wayward bride called Israel. But we can't, we can't sidestep it because it's a picture of us too. It can be the picture of the church and it can be a picture of us as individuals. And so I'm asking you, Lord, that as we are looking into this book as we're wrapping it up here that father you would use what needs to be heard by each of us today so father would you do that and and it's in jesus name we pray amen please have your bible open i i hope you've been able to see or be a part of each one of these messages we're messages we're actually in the seventh message on this so we've been two, doing two chapters a week with a 14 chapter book you can do the math but we're kind of in the seventh inning stretch here all right, where we've stood, we've, we've read the scripture together, and now 
we're seated and we're, we're taking in what, is, what is, um, God is trying to uh, communicate to us. And so we have in this first, first verses here of uh, chapter 13, the, the, the Lord is relentless. The Lord is relentless. God is in to this relationship. He is pursuing us, and he's a good, he, he isn't a stalker, all right, because those are creepy, all right? But this is, a, this is a good, good person to have be into a relationship with us. He is going to be the best for us. In fact, all of those other all of those other relationships that we've been flirting with or playing with will lead to destruction. And, he, and he's putting that out before us. He's saying that is the case. He's trying to protect us. And so you may be here today and you're flirting with disaster. It may not be uh, a relationship with somebody else. I hope that isn't the case if it's, if it's not your spouse or it's, it's not something that is good for you. But it could be something that has taken precedence over God. And God has made us the way he's made us. He's creator God. He's made us that nothing will fill that vacuum like he will. So we'll try, and we're, we're idle, I-D-O-L, we're idol-making factories. We're made to worship. That's just how we're wired. And our satisfaction will only be found in him. So he's relentless. He, he doesn't give up, and he's telling us once again how much he loves us and, how, and if you keep heading down this road, what will happen? And so this, this, this tribe that he picks is, is, is appropriate. Remember the, the blessing that was given by Jacob? We talked about that last week where the Jacob, when he's blessing his sons and Joseph brings his sons and he sets it up so that Manasseh, his oldest, is on the right-hand side of Jacob of Jacob and he's because he's older and that's just how it works but God says God wants Jacob to bless Ephraim over Manasseh and so Jacob crosses his arms and he blesses Ephraim and Ephraim is amazing tribe it's successful out of Ephraim comes of all people Joshua that that leads them into the land and does these these amazing things and Ephraim just has that reputation. And, and so he's a representation of the northern kingdom of Israel. So whenever you see Ephraim, you're not just talking about that tribe. It's a representation. It would be like saying, mentioning Washington, D.C., and we would know, oh, they're talking about America when that's being said. And so God's relentless. Look at verse 1. And this is the reputation that Ephraim had. When Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. It's almost like E.F. Hutton, if you remember those commercials. E.F. Hutton speaks, you know. Everybody gets quiet. Something, something of value is being said. Something, something of power is being said. So when Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. That's the power it had. He was exalted in Israel. But he incurred guilt through Baal. Baal's an idol. And died. This, this time of them turning to idolatry, it says there was a, a set point in time they're dead and they think they're alive. They think they're fine. We're successful. I don't, know, I don't understand how you can say we're not doing well. Look at, look at where we are financially. Look at the ledger. Look at, look, at, look at how we're doing in all of these aspects of, of life. I, I don't understand what you're saying. And God says, you're actually dead. You have an appearance of life, but you're dead. So when they're right with God, when they were right with God, nations trembled. When, when Israel spoke, people listened. And in her authority through her was ministry and effectiveness. But past greatness, please hear me on this one, past greatness does not guarantee future success. And so they start worshiping other gods. And so there's no roaring, there's no trembling, there's no impact, there's no effectiveness, there's no ministry. And that can happen to us too. 
Look at verse 2. And now they sin more and more. So their sins are accumulating. That's why I, I'm constantly saying to you kind of a warning. If, if you're heading towards something, stop. Sometimes we do something and we're, ah, I'm in. I'm here. Might as well keep doing this. You ever get into a movie and you go, this movie is horrible. Well, we paid for it. And you just sit through the whole thing. I, I, we've literally, at a certain point, Kim and I just look at each other, go back, and we go, we want our money back. This, is, this isn't worth it. So stop. Even today, stop. So they sin more and more and make for themselves metal images. Look at this. Idols skillfully made of their, sil- of their silver, all of them the work of a craftsman. And so what's happening is they're doing a, a, a work of worship. They're, they're um, having spiritual death. Remember it said they were dead. And it leads to spiritual decay. And you see it going on with wasted pursuits. They're, they're pursuing idols. Look what they're doing. Wasted treasure. These are quality things they're using in building the idol. Wasted talents. These are craftsmen. These are gifted people and wasted dignity. Look what they start to do. It is said of them, those who offer human sacrifice kiss calves. He's not talking about the bottom of a leg. He's talking about they go to these idols and they kiss them as if that idol is the thing that gave them all that they got. He's saying your way, these are gifted people that are putting all of their stuff in this thing. That's why I'm constantly beating the drum with you, and I want this to be the case for me. The hobbies that I have, the interests that I have, that they would have a purpose to leverage them for the glory of God. And I could start with sports. You weren't gifted in sports for you. Somehow, and you ask the Lord, how can I... How can I use this for your glory, God? You weren't gifted in theater for you. Doesn't mean you just have to do Christian plays. But how can I leverage this for God? You aren't gifted with cars for you. How can, God, how can, I, how can I use this for your glory? Because all of those things, moth and rust, will corrupt eventually. And I could... As I get to know you, the gifts that you have, the abilities that you have, you can look around the room and start naming things. You guys are just talking about me. But what are you doing with that thing for his glory? These are gifted people, and they're crafting things that they'll eventually bow down to. I don't bow down to it, but in your heart, you kind of do. It's, It's... it's got your heart. And God's saying, I want your heart, and I gave you the love for that thing so that you would use that thing for me. And I don't know, by the way, I don't know how that could be the case. But God's, God's amazing. He can give you, and then afterwards you go, all this time I've been doing this just for me. And he said, no, I want you to use that for me. Look at verses 3 through 6. Therefore, this is what he's saying, that therefore they shall be like the morning mist or like the dew that goes early away. Life just flies. I'm 62 tomorrow. Don't worry about getting gifts. I'm not asking. If I'm 62 tomorrow, how did I get here? 62. It just flies. And some of you are older. Oh, that's nothing. But you know, you see, it just flies. And left to myself, my life is going to be worth a mist. I mean, that's what life is without God. Morning dew that's gone. Like the chaff that swirls from the threshing floor or like smoke from a window. Boy, he picks all of those pictures to make you go so that when you see that, you see the dew in the morning and the next time you go out, "Eh, that's my life. Fire, smoke, that's my life. 
Without God, that's my life. He uses these pictures so that you and I would not, hey, I sat in church, oh, that's interesting, smoke. No, he's using that so that when you see it, you would remember and go, God, I want my life to mean more than just that. And then he, then he does the change here, the conjunction. But, but I am the Lord your God. And he's going to talk some history. From the land of Egypt, you know no God but me. And beside me, there is no Savior. He brings them back to, to Egypt. He brings them back to Sinai. He says, the first commandments, I'm the one you are to worship. You ever notice that we, a lot of times when it comes to commandments right away, we think we move right to the relational commandments. Um, no murder, no lying, no adultery, no. And he's saying, no, you got to go to those first ones. Because if I have a proper view of God, that's going to have ramifications for my behavior. And so he says right away, I want you to know, the reason that you're sinning, the reason that you're doing this stuff, is because you've forgotten who I am. Verse 5, it was I who knew you in the wilderness. I've been doing this relationship. I was, I was your boyfriend. I was your guy. I was your man. I was it for you. And I went with you through those hard things. And now you want to go with the flashy stuff? He will burn you. That guy's going to burn you. In the land of drought. But when they had grazed, they became full. They were filled and their heart was lifted up. Therefore, they forgot me. He's going, man, I gave you all this stuff and you don't want me anymore. Bring this back to sports teams. Those of you that follow that stuff, you see it. I don't know if you've ever seen this. I know with the Cardinals, they've been so successful. There's times where they're winning and they're winning well. Do you know what happens when they win the World Series? You know what happens the next year? Guys are writing autobiographies. You just met them. Or they're demanding a bigger contract. What happens with the team? The team breaks up. They forget what made them the winners that they sticking together. It's rare today where an athlete goes, you know what, I'll sacrifice a little bit of pay for you to get some new guys, keep this ball rolling. Like, no, I'm going to get as much money as I can. And we do that with the Lord. He gives us something and we forget about him. We sidestep. We, 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 we act like I can do life without him and we can't do life without him. Psalm 84, 11. God wants to bless us. For the Lord God is a sun, a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Now, it may not be the good thing how you define good, but it's best. And later you look in your life and you go, thank you, God, I didn't deserve this. Let's keep going, verse 7 and 8. So I am to them like a lion, like a leopard, I will lurk beside the way. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will tear open their breast, and there I will devour them like a lion, as a wild beast would rip them open. His picture, he's trying to get across the picture of how brutal it is when we don't walk with God. Isn't it interesting he picks these animals too? These animals sound familiar with another prophecy. Lion, leopard, bear, wild beast. Sound like a lot like Daniel, remember? When he was talking about the different kingdoms that would rise. Israel, you, you, you don't want me? I'm going to turn you over to the Gentiles. You are not going to like this. The Lord would be to his people those different animals, and he'd rather want to be a mother hen, kind. Look at this, Luke 13. Look at how Jesus responds. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. You don't want me? Lion, leopard, bear, wild beast. It's just how it goes. Verse 9. He destroys you, O Israel, for you are against me, against your helper. I'm trying to be your helper. You ever have that with somebody? You're trying to help them. You're, the, you're better for them what, than this has to offer. 
You're destroying yourself. But in me, the Lord says, but in me, not from me, but in me is your help. 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. What we want, truly want, is God. We're walking with Jesus. Everything we need is found in him. He doesn't give us life. He is our life. He doesn't give us bread. He is the bread. He doesn't show us the way. He is the way. Verses 10 and 11. Where now is your king to save you in all your cities? Where are your rulers, those of whom you said, give me a king and princes? Remember they did this early in their history? We've just went through it in 1 Samuel. We want a king like other... They, but did you know under Samuel they were winning every war? They're winning everything. They go, you know what? We'd like a king. The name Saul, you know what it means? You asked for it. And you know what? Good looking, tall, hiding in the lu- around the luggage. What is up with this? And then what does he start to do? Starts getting full of himself. They start losing battles. But here's why. Here's why. They want the wins, but they don't want God. Give us a king like other nations. Samuel, you talk about God too much. We don't want to stop. You're getting too Bible-y for us. They reject God. I mean, look back here, 1 Samuel 10, verse 19. But today you have rejected your God who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses. And you said to him, set a king over us. Now therefore present yourself before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Okay, this is what you want. I'll give you what you want. You won't be happy. I know you won't be happy. But I'll give you what you want. Verse 12. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is kept in store. Look at that verse again with me. You could pass over it pretty quickly if you're not careful. His sin is kept in store. That sounds like sins can be stored up. We can be doing stuff, and you ever look at your garage and go, how did I get all this stuff? Got to have another garage sale. It just accumulates, and that's what can happen with sin. And so God's patient with us. Get stored in the garage. Get stored in the garage. Get stored in the garage. You want to pull into the garage. We don't use them for cars anymore. They're storage of our stuff. It's what can happen in our lives. Like, why, is, why can't I use, why doesn't this work the way it's supposed to work? Well, you got a bunch of sins stored up in there. And that's what happened with Israel. If only the people had confessed, their sin could have been forgiven. But because they failed to confess their sin, it's going to be held against them. It's in storage. I would say to the Lord, Father, forgive me. I'd ask you to empty that. And that's the acknowledge to him, I need your help with this. Because left to myself, I got, these, I got these secret places. I got that different closet I put things in. Yeah, God, you can be here. So, yeah, I'd like to go in that room. Uh, no, I don't want you in that room. Because you know it's in that room. Verse 13. The pangs of childbirth come for him. But he is an unwise son, for at the right time he does not present himself at the opening of the womb. It's like a baby inside going, the best thing for it would be to be born. No, I kind of like it in here. We go, that's stupid. That's silly. That doesn't work that way. That's what it looks like. Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from our eyes. You see, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? This is actually in the opposite um, section there. This is used as a way of saying it has no victory. It has no power. In this passage, he's warning them, quit playing with this because it will have power in your life. See, God would ransom his people. Matthew 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. God wants to get us out of this stuff. 
And then some really hard verses. Even as Ron was reading them, I'm going, oh, Father. Verse 15 and 16. Though he may flourish among his brothers, the east wind, that's that's Samaria, that that is, I'm sorry, that's Assyria. The east wind, the wind of the Lord shall come, rising from the wilderness, and his fountain shall dry up. His spring shall be parched. It shall strip his treasury. So all that stuff you were banking on, it's going to be gone of every precious thing. Samaria shall bear her guilt because she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their little ones shall be dashed in pieces and their pregnant women ripped open. And you read a verse like that and you go, God, what are you saying there? He's saying, if you don't follow me, this is what's going to happen with Assyria. They are, and they did do this. Brutal people. That's why when people say stuff of, about the word of God and they go, why did Israel do this as they went into the land of the Canaanites? If this kind of stuff was going on, which it was, in these people, they were evil people. Wouldn't you want somebody to come in and clean house? And stop this from happening? I would. And so, so we see in this passage of scripture, he says these things that are really, really hard. And he's saying, if you keep doing this, this is what these people are like, and they will do this against you. And here's what I think sometimes we like. We like freedom. We like freedom until God stops it. Like, I think some people go, well, don't let this happen. God, don't let this happen. He's going, no, it's going to happen. Well, well, um, stop. Okay, when I get too close, stop me, God. You'd hate that in life. We want to do what we want to do. If, we, if he did do that every time he'd go, I wonder what life is like past this. And so God in his love says, I'm, I'm telling you, don't do this. This is what will happen. They asked for it. And sometimes we're watching ones that we love dearly and they head down a road and you know it won't be good because of what you've experienced in the past. You know it won't be good. Mark my words. And it starts to happen. And they're shocked and you're like, I told you. It's interesting, just last night, our granddaughter, it's her birthday and we had them here and mom <laughs> mom said to her okay we need to do this it was bedtime she confronts her and she says something and she just looks at her kind of like this look and she's cute by the way they cute that's why they keep living they're cute all right <laughs> and she's looking and she's looking almost in defiance and when mom starts making the move toward her no 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 it's like mhm we're going to have a talk in the back room which i'm like mm-hmm. Not because I want my grandchild to go through pain, but I know that that little bit of pain here will save a lot of pain down here. And we keep we keep thinking that God parents like we parent. One more time. Time out. One, two, three. And you're watching the kid, and the kid's going, <laughs> I'm getting away with this. And that's at three years old they're doing that. And God won't play. He don't play. Point number two. The Lord says, return. The Lord says, return. Look at verse, or chapter 14. So he's, he's, call, re, he's calling them home. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, this is a beautiful prayer, take away all iniquity. Accept what is good, and we will pay with bowls the vows of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. We will say no more, O oh, our God, to the work of our hands. In you the orphan finds mercy. If we just render to God the sacrifice of praise, that we we're saying, You're the one, you're the one that's going to take care of us, not these alliances that we have with other nations. You ever watch our country and just go, haven't we learned? Haven't we learned? If we just, if we just figured this out, if we, if we just do these things, somebody would get, you know, I think it'd be cool if we repented. They'd be, You're crazy. You're crazy. No, what's crazy is we keep doing the same things and nothing's changing. 
Maybe let's try this. It's verses 4 and 5. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. So just as sin is contrasted with repentance, the destruction of land in chapter 13 is contrasted with the potential fruitfulness here in chapter 14. When you return to God. Today that could be your story. I'm returning to God. You're here at church, but your heart may be far from him. Come home. Come home. Aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of doing this on your own? Verse 6. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive and his fragrance like Lebanon. And if they had returned to him, God's people would be as beautiful as a fruit-bearing olive tree. The God's, God would have these unsearchable this unsearchable, amazing grace. And we would actually, as, as Gentiles, we're going to be grafted into that very tree. Thank God. Verse 7, they shall return, I love this, and dwell beneath my shadow. They shall flourish like the grain. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fame shall be like the wine of Lebanon. You ever see somebody whose life they turned back to the Lord? You can just see it in their countenance how it's changed. Oh, Ephraim, what have, I do, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. Quit thinking these things are going to be the things. that. Quit, quit in thinking that this person is going to be the thing. It's me, God saying. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Just a beautiful thing. Verse 9. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. I want to be wise. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the way of the Lord, ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them. But transgressors stumble in them. He wants to give us one more reminder. I, I, I want to tell you all that, but I just want you to know, if you keep going down this, you're going to stumble. And it looks silly. You ever watch somebody walking through the parking lot of Walmart and they trip and they look around like, they trip? <laughs> like, I didn't do that. You did that. You look stupid trying to. <laughs> That's what we look like without God. Silly. It's silly. You see, respect, repentance sounds like a scary word, doesn't it? But, it? but all it is is it's coming home. And it's a home you'd love. It's not a home you're like, oh, my, if you knew my house. This is a home you'd love. Repentance is not just a commitment to a new way. It's a fresh commitment to the Lord God himself. And Israel is to return to a person, to the Lord. Think of the best person you could think of as a representation of God. I love going to see that person. I love that person. When I'm with them, I feel accepted. I feel safe. I feel loved. Multiply that by a billion, billion, billion. And that still doesn't touch God. That's the person you want. And today could be the day. Think about this story. You've heard it before, Luke 15. It always reminds me of a story, Luke 15, 17. This is the, the, the prodigal son. He, he, um, he had said to his father, give me the inheritance. And in that culture, that basically said, I wish you were dead. Give me your money. I don't want you. I want your money. And he goes and he lives like a crazy man, doing, doing Gomer-like things. This story gets me. But when he came to himself, so he's sitting there with, in pig slop, envying pig's food, not bacon, eating, envying eating what the pigs are eating. He's envying that. And then it occurs to him, huh, my dad. Even the servants of my dad. Look at this. Came to himself. He says, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with the pigs, with hunger. I will arise and I'll go to my father. And I will say to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. So there's some words tied to repentance. There's some understanding of I'm, I'm wording my thoughts here. It's not just, oh, I'll go. It's you think about it. And he does that. I am no, I'm no longer worthy. And he arose and came to his father. And this is, this is the father we have. This is the dad we have. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. Now, his father didn't go in the pigsty, but his father waited. And every day he's watching for him. And he felt compassion. And he ran. This is very, this is very um, humbling when you think about this in the Mideastern culture. He ran and embraced him and kissed him. Probably smelled like pig stuff. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and, and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. Now his older son, so, so what can happen sometimes is there's a, there's a person that comes back, Lord, and there's some of us that have been doing church for a long time, and, and we've been, I've been here this whole time. Why is that person getting attention? And by the way, I don't sense any of that here. But this can creep in. The older son is in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. And he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, well, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry. He refused to go in. His father came out and treated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you. I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when, the, but when this son of yours, can't even say his brother's name, when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Aren't you glad we got a God like that instead of like the older brother? And some of you might be living and thinking because you have some past memories of somebody that was doing church or was in your life and they looked a lot more like the older brother than the dad here. Can I tell you, God is the dad here. This is who we serve. This is, if you come home, this is who you come home to. I invite you. This story, this book of romance we've had here before us, it's a, call, it's, a, it's a picture of the beautiful, amazing God that we have. Is there any idols in your life? Are there some things in your life right now that you're holding on to? And you really like them, and they, and they do make you happy every now and then. Can I say, God is, God is such a good God that he gives us good stuff besides him being a good God. He's, he's really amazing. Can I invite you to him today? Please don't pass up this opportunity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Hosea. But even more than that, because Hosea left to himself, if we, were, if we spent time with Hosea, we'd find stuff. He's just a man. But he was your man at the time. And he was giving us a picture of you. And so, Father, today, each and every one of us, we need you, Lord. So, so I'd ask you, God, that, that you would be lifted up, that you would be um, glorified in our lives. That the things that we hold on to, the things that we say, that's the thing, that's the thing. And we put all our chips in there that we that we'd say to you, God, we want it to be you. And if that thing was it, what it ought to be, then you'll give us that thing. If it isn't, it diminishes. Our, our love for that would, would be gone. 
the more we see the beauty of you. So, Father, would you, would you help us with that this morning? I'd ask you to, to help us to not soon forget what we've learned from this book today and these past few weeks. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.